We continue our look at God's story. And today we focus on King David. Imagine you're standing in the grocery store and you happen to look down at the magazines and you can't believe the article and the headline that's there. Or, or you're flipping through the channels, you know, exercising your thumb on the remote. A and you come across a TV show like Access Hollywood or Entertainment Tonight, and you're shocked at the story of what is on the screen. You're shocked, although not completely surprised. It happened. Another celebrity scandal. Celebrity stories sell. The more sensational the scandal, the better, huh? We love a good story. Sports heroes gone bad. Music idols who have done the outrageous. Politicians caught in a compromising situation. It happens. There is something intriguing, something that draws us into the story when someone else has fallen from graces. And the juicier the story, the better, huh? Let's be honest, we love it, don't we? We do. We have one of those stories today. It's a sex and murder scandal of a prominent religious political figure. It's a good guy gone bad. It's quite a story. His name is David. Chosen at an early age to be God's king, to succeed King Saul, the first king, taking over as king of Israel. Of course, he's one of many brothers. Jesse's his father. And he's doing the job none of the other boys want to do. They leave it to the youngest. Go out and tend the sheep. So that's where David is spending his time. He is an accomplished musician. And in time, he's brought into the king's palace to play music for the king. Can you imagine how his brothers felt about that? And then he's known for his great skill with a slingshot. He brought down the great warrior named Goliath. He's put in charge of the king's army, and his success is overwhelming. He befriends Saul's son, Jonathan. And they develop this bond, this brotherly love. And it's this brotherly love that saves David time and time again from Saul's rage and anger towards him. Rage and anger because David becomes more popular with the people than Saul, King Saul himself. When Saul and his, brother, and his son Jonathan are both killed in battle, David is anointed king of Judah, and Saul's fourth son is chosen as king of Israel. And they compete for the entire kingdom. In a couple years, Saul's fourth son is murdered. Leaves the door wide open for David to take over the entire kingdom. A dream come true, a united kingdom, finally. And it happens. He defeats all their enemies. Peace and prosperity reign for the people of God. Who wouldn't vote for this guy if he was running for political office? He's nothing short of a savior. Surely this new king, King David, can do nothing wrong, right? Blessed by God in so many ways, David plans to build this majestic temple in the city of Jerusalem, the capital of the kingdom. He's got great plans to bring the Ark of the Covenant, showing the world that here is where God reigns on earth, that God dwells with God's people. God's presence is right here in Jerusalem, but God has other plans. 
God plans to establish David's household forever. Wow. A dream come true. It doesn't get any better than that. A hero with a heart. A leader with a longing for God. A king who has compassion for the people. But all that glitters is not gold. King David becomes the stuff of tabloid news with one name, Bathsheba. Here's how it goes. In the springtime, David is up on the roof of the palace looking out over his kingdom, just basking in the glory of God and the blessings of God. Can you see him standing there? He's looking around, and over here on this little house, on the rooftop, he sees a beautiful woman bathing. Uh-oh. Can you see him standing there? He's just watching her. And his mind starts to run. And he begins to lust after her. Uh-oh. He summons for her to come to the palace. He has sex with her. She becomes pregnant. She belongs to another man. Her husband, Uriah, is out fighting the war where David, the king, ought to be. So he summons for Uriah to come home to hopefully he'll sleep with his wife. He doesn't. He sleeps at the door of the palace devoted to the king. David sends Uriah back to the front line with his marching orders to fight up where there's fighting and then everyone else is to retreat and he is to be killed and that's exactly what happens. Of course, this is not good. This is not the kind of thing we want to see happen to King David. David is seen as one of the greatest leaders. How could this happen? Amazingly, though, he pays the price for his sins. When confronted with similar sin in our day, let me say that differently. David, when he was confronted with his sin, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. He repented. We've had similar leaders in our day confronted with a similar sin, and they've denied it. I believe Bill's words were something like, I did not have sex with that woman. But not with David. David responds differently. He's a man after God's own heart. Instead of denying it, he confesses it. He repents and takes responsibility for his actions. He doesn't blame Bathsheba. He takes full responsibility. He holds himself accountable. He pays the price for his sin. It isn't that the paparazzi got to him, standing outside the palace, wanting the scandal of the story, but God sent Nathaniel, a prophet, to expose David's sin. And he pays the price for that sin. The baby he and Bathsheba have together dies. And he loses the respect of the people. Amazingly, though, he does not lose favor with God. He stays in God's graces. David is brought to his knees in repentance, admits his sin, pleads for forgiveness from God. A good guy gone bad, yet remains in God's favor. Wow. David is seen as one of the greatest leaders in the history of God's people. And yet we have this scandalous story of him. What makes him so great? Why is he someone we can look up to and learn from? From his political power, yes, but he's no longer reigning on earth. His military skills and accomplishments, yes, but he's no longer in charge of an army anywhere. His perfection? No way. He is as flawed as they come. So what sets David apart? Two things. One, he never tries to be God. 
Never. And he lived into the promises that God made to him. Our reading this morning from Isaiah is about a people hundreds of years after King David. They are off in exile in Babylon. And Isaiah reminds the people of the glory days of the past. He reminds them that God is faithful. He reminds them of God's promises. He reminds them to remember what God has done for them. He's telling them all of this because they've been cut off from their land. They've been cut off from their homes. They've been cut off from their religion. They are in exile. They wonder if God has abandoned them. Where's the promise God made to David, the people are wondering. Why are we stuck here in Babylon if God's promises are true? Isaiah speaks a word of truth and promise and hope to the people. He says God is faithful. All you need to do is look back to see what God has done, to see what God's going to do in the future. And God is preparing a future for you. God is preparing a banquet meal for you like never before. That's the setting for our reading from Isaiah this morning. Check it out. It's up on the screen. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah writes, Ho, in other words, yo, listen up. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully, carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know. Excuse me. See, I made him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know. And nations that you do not know shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. As I pointed out, David was imperfect, yet blessed by God. The people were imperfect, yet blessed by God. Their situation was imperfect, yet blessed by God. God's promises call for faith, no matter what the situation. That's because God's promises offer hope and new life, no matter what the situation. David was the means for God's promise. Through David, Jesus comes into the world. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. David isn't. Let me say that again. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. David isn't. So what makes David so great? Why is he called a witness to the peoples? There's an assumption that religious people must be perfect. We expect perfection from anyone who claims to have a relationship with God. David gives us a different perspective. His power is not in perfection. Let me say that again. His power is not in perfection. He's definitely flawed. 
And he would have been crucified in the ministry just like some guy named Arnold who did something very similar. As long as we understand that God's story is not about perfection, it's about promises. It changes our whole perspective on life. God's promises restores life, gives hope to the best and the worst of all peoples and all situations. God's promises are for you and for me, and we are called to live into those promises for others. We are the means for God's promises. That's how David lived, and that's how we are to live. In other words, we are blessed to be a blessing to others. Say that with me. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Now, here's the thing. As long as David lived for others, doing for others, he did great. But as soon as David started living for himself, he messed up royally. And so do we. Last week, I asked you to read and reflect on Romans 12. I know you all did it. I was overloaded with emails. It's going to take me all afternoon to respond to them. So there's still time. I don't know if you didn't respond. So I'll get home around 12, 30, 1 o'clock. You have time. Send me an email. I won't look at the time. I'll just assume my computer messed up. So you got time. I'll be looking for it. But I ask you that because Romans 12 is all about living for others, not ourselves. Romans 12 is all about being a blessing to others because we've been blessed by God. Romans 12 is all about overcoming evil with good. The goodness of God that's in the promises of God for us. It's not about living to perfection. It's about living into the promises God makes with us every day. We are to be witnesses of God's grace in the world. Imagine. Imagine if you would, a world where we are comfortable enough with one another that we hold each other accountable to our sins. And we repented when those sins were brought to light that we asked God for forgiveness, that we looked at each other not as perfect people, but people living into the promises of God. Think about this as you leave here this morning. If your name and your story were to appear in the news, would it be a story of scandal or a story of faithfulness? The choice is yours. Because the promises of God are yours.